a comical title. Spike Milligan poem, Oh, the Ning Nang Nong where the trees go bong and the monkeys all say boo. There's a Nong Ning Nang where the cows go clang and the teapots jibber jabber jew. So it's a, it's a bit of a comical sort of poem to start with, but I thought I'm the only thing between you guys and beer, so I need to keep it pretty light this time of the afternoon. But it also has got a few things to teach us about, I suppose, land cover mapping and how we extend that out to people. I kind of changed this talk around a couple of days ago when I was a bit jet lagged, so I don't know how it's going to work out. But I thought rather than talk about research, I kind of wanted to talk a bit more about, I guess, you know, how the Earth engine will operationalise a lot of stuff. So as Tyler said, I'm with a sort of a collaborative of state government agencies and universities. And we try and do large area land cover mapping. We started about 16 years ago when Landsat data was $5,000 a scene and we used to have to buy 89 of them to cover Queensland. So, you know, that's almost half a million dollars a year it was costing us to, to map stuff. Um, so we map, you know, vegetation extent and clearing. And I guess the monkeys here in the picture represent, you know, some of the biodiversity that we're trying to conserve by, you know, mapping these trees. And it probably also represents some of the recalcitrant landholders that we, you know, run up against sometimes um, when we ping them for illegal tree clearing. More recently, we have started mapping fractional cover and fractional ground cover. So I've started looking at the proportion of green and dry vegetation and bare ground. And our maps of bare ground, we, we usually display them with red as being bare. And as the country dries out, the ground becomes quite bare as it is in this picture. And that could be due to drought or could be due to a whole lot of things. We usually send a, you know, an alert out to, to graziers. We speak to the cows, we speak to the Great Barrier Reef. Bong, you know, we send an alert out. So that's kind of where I'm at. But I, I suppose what I wanted to talk about here was how we can operationalise a lot of this research and where that can go. So I thought I'd do that by an example. This is a pub in Alice Springs. Uh, it's notable because it was the location of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, which is a, a sort of an 80s Australian movie. Um, it's a juicy rump. And I was sitting here one day with, with uh, some mates of mine from South Australia. And we were talking about you know, some of the, the mapping work we do. So these guys, Rob, he'd been talking with a mate of mine, Gary Baston, about some of the grazing gradient work that we've been working on. So grazing gradients are a, a way of looking at how grazing pressure you know, changes as you move away from a watering point. And we developed a method to operationalise that based on Landsat data so we didn't need a watering point and we could you know, look at large area land cover sort of changes and the, and the condition of the rangelands. Now, I'd had a couple of beers, it was Friday afternoon, and Rob said, so how do you reckon to go in South Australia? And I mean, I'd do anything for a beer. And I, I said, oh, you know, how about we give it a go? So I stagger back to my hotel room at you know, midnight or something like that. And I sort of log onto the work system and I add the path row in South Australia to, to our processing system. I'm not running this on the Earth engine at this stage. And I guess that triggers off a whole range of processes which I guess go to linking the research through to the delivery at the other end. And that's what I want to talk about. So first of all, there's the research. So the work that we do sort of draws upon a large amount of field data. We've traveled, you know, in the years about a million kilometers around Australia. The work here that I'm talking about relies on this network of, you can see there, about 2,000 uh, sites. Each one of those sites has cost roughly $1,500 to collect. And we collect fractional cover, tree cover, ground cover, vegetation surveys at all of those. So we've got a lot of data, okay? Most of our data now is collected using Open Data Kit. It is awesome. Um, if you're gonna undertake a large monitoring program, go for Open Data Kit, it's great. Uh, we use it for you know, land cover, LIDAR, the whole shebang. So we do the work, we go and talk with the ecologists, the botanists, all those people. We write the paper, we validate the results, we publish the book. That's great. What happens next? Okay, you've got to operationalise this stuff. So you've got to be able to say, you know, guy comes up to you in the pub and says, I want to run it in my area, how do you do it? So the following Monday morning, um, this is kind of what happens. And this is, this is our processing system. So <clears throat> Sunday night, well, I'm flying back, okay, the system's checking and syncing against the USGS database, okay, we ingest all the, mo all the Landsat data that we don't have for that scene, we've got most of it. Do a top of atmosphere correction, we do a thermal calibration on top of that. Okay, we mask cloud, we mask cloud shadow, we mask snow, there's no snow in South Australia, we mask it anyway. Um, <clears throat> we, we mask terrain shadow, we do a bad data mask, we've got a whole lot of masks there, okay. We then detect water, okay, and we mask water out of downstream processes, we also shovel off you know, time series water masks, because that's useful for policy, it's useful for ecologists at the other end. Okay, we run a foliage cover model calibrated to our field data. 
um, we'll then run an annual foliage cover model. We then do a wooded change detection. This is all sort of happening automated in the background. That's useful for policy and compliance as you go through. Okay, now the sort of the harder stuff. Okay, so we, we build a BRDF and terrain corrected surface reflectance product so that we've got constant sun angles uh, through the entire time series. We then do time series burnt area masking on top of that. Some of that goes off to policy, some of that goes off to emergency services. We still haven't got to Rob's data. We then do fractional cover calibration. So that's based on all the field data we've collected. We then do seasonal fractional cover calibration because people don't like gaps in data and there's lots of cloud and a whole lot of other stuff. So we calculate seasonal stuff using metroids. We then work out seasonal persistent green. So imagine you've got green cover varying over time. Um, most of the time your grasses and will dry out, your trees will remain green. We fit a spline to the bottom of the green, the green fractional cover to get an estimate of the persistent green. Okay. We then do a trend summary on top of that so you can see whether your green's going up or down. That's useful for policy. Once again, they want to know about vegetation thickening. Um, it's also really good for weed mapping as well because you can see areas that are thickening up with you know, occasional lodica and things like that. Okay. We then do a seasonal ground cover calculation. So we've got, the, we've got the full foliage cover greenness. We then take the trees out because we don't want them for ground cover. And that's really useful for landholders and policy. Okay, finally we're getting to the point where we can calculate Rob's data. Time series percentile, so we look at the entire time series and work out percentiles uh, through time. That's actually used for reporting for pastoral boards across Australia. Um, and it's also used to set government policy for droughts and things like that. And now we're finally at the part where we can do the, basically the dynamic reference cover calculation. So the, you know, looking at what's happening in the Rob's area. So we do a moving window reference cover calculation. Now that used to take us about two weeks per scene because it's a, it's a damn big convolution. We've got a two and a half thousand by two and a half thousand pixel window convolution moving across. <clears throat> We've since sort of done some clever use of histograms and recoded in CNA. It takes about 16 hours for basically the entire state, so it's not too bad. We then look at the change, and we give that to ecologists like Rob. And finally, and this is probably one of the most important steps, is we deliver the data at the other end. So we deliver that via web maps and extension. So what you see here on this page is two things. You see some paper maps, which are coming out, which are, you know, people are looking at pretty seriously. Um, and you see an image on my mobile phone. So, you know, I'm, I'm standing here, I'm looking at this paddock here. Blue, blue in this case means that this paddock has increased um, in condition, and I'm using condition as an index here, um, over the past 15 years. This paddock here is potentially declined in condition. And these pretty serious looking people here are evaluating the data, they've got photo standards, they've got the maps. And most of the time this stuff's right. But the important thing is that this map here, this really simple thing that's you know, being displayed on your phone that they're looking at here, has taken 1,200 Landsat images and a whole stack of data to process it. And the reason it's being used is because it's being put out there in an accessible form. So what happened there? Okay, so what was the system that made it all kind of work? And people are picking up this stuff and using it. Okay, typically in research, or typically in the system that we've got here, we've got these sort of three distinct boxes. So we've got the research in the informatics. Okay, this is the research that you know, everyone in this room is doing. Okay, we've got the model development and optimization, and that's where the rubber really hits the road and, and you actually start processing stuff. And then you've got outreach and extension at the other end. And I think really the Earth Engine is awesome in that it ties a whole lot of this stuff together, okay? So good examples of this where it doesn't work, okay? So you've got a grad student, does some fantastic research, publishes a paper, that's it. No one picks it up. In the middle there, let's say you've got a government department there using air photos to assess some measure of something or other. There's some really cool research over here, but they don't pick it up because there's no connection between the research and the operations. And finally, at the other end, you've got an NGO or something that's you know, going around with paper maps um, and you know, paper forms. They're not actually going out there with dynamic content to talk to people. And so you've got gaps, you've got gaps, and I think the Earth Engine can fill them really well. And that's kind of what it does. So I guess the first part here is that, <clears throat> okay, say you've got research and you build a platform on top of that, which has got all the satellite imagery. It's a scalable platform. It's got a really nice front end. You can code on it. You can play with it. You don't need a scientific programmer to take your algorithms and run them, okay? That is awesome. So you're going to scale on a sample platform. That's the Earth Engine. The other side, though, is some sort of flexible response, some sort of flexible delivery system. And I think that's 
kind of where a lot of people here that I saw today are getting, getting at as well. So we're going out through you know, App Engine, App Spot, those sorts of things and getting the data out at the other end. Some of the recent updates to the Earth Engine API too where you, know, you can get a graph and you can get the data out at the other end is, is a fantastic delivery tool. Once you connect all these three things together, you fill in those gaps, then your science can go out and other people can build on top of that. And I'd really encourage people to try to sort of link all these things together. That final part, getting the data out and getting it used by the people, is possibly one of the hardest steps that I personally have had to take. Because I, I, I'm talking here about sort of letting go, letting go of your data, letting go of your algorithms. So these maps that you can see here, this is a clipping from a, from a producer newspaper, are showing basically some imagery over someone's paddock, okay? Their data that we've, we've computed, um, we've got the same algorithm running, running on the Earth engine and running on our systems as well. Okay, but the producers, there's no badging there that says you know, where this stuff is from, okay? So we've, this, is, this data is effectively coming from the same system that builds the maps of tree clearing that all the landholders hate, they hate us, we're the tree police. But <laughs> because it's, it's badged as coming from a producer body, people pick it up and use it, graziers, landholders, they'll grab it because, hey, it's got this stamp from a, from a producer body. It's not coming from the government, it's not coming from a university that they may perceive as being out of touch. It's coming from a producer body. So, you know, we've got data, we've released it out there, people can pick it up, rebadge it, put it into their extension tools. It's kind of hard, but what this does is it drives uptake and that tends to push money back into, you know, further research in your, your division. So it's a kind of an extension value chain. Another sort of simple example of this is some maps that, that went out on, on ABC Late Line, a national TV show in Australia. So these two maps here are fractional cover. You can see here the red represents the amount of bare ground, the green is green vegetation, the blue is, is non-green dry grass, um, non-green vegetation. And these were used to show you know, the difference between, <coughs> um, a bit hard to see on that map there, um, the extent of the drought. So, you can see here there's a lot more, lot more green up here. This is a standard year up, up in Queensland. There's, there's usually a fair bit of grass that's growing up around here. You can see, you know, currently we're in the midst of a pretty bad drought as well. Um, and there's a lot more bare ground, I suppose, that's going up. There's no grass, okay? And all the northern cattlemen up there are in a lot of trouble. We couldn't get any of these products up on national TV, but producer bodies can because they could grab it, they could put it out there, and then ends up being used and basically helps drive drought policy. Another really quite nice uh, bit of work is, is being done by Dr. Stuart Finn and Sabrina Wu at the University of Queensland under a Google Earth Engine Research Award. So they've been building an API into some of this cover data uh, precisely to, to use with, with ecological data. So they've been talking with a lot of the ecological community across Australia, looking at long-term faunal records and trying to work out what's driving the abundance of uh, small mammals. So in a lot of, lot of Australia, and particularly, well, here, you know, in, in, the, in the desert regions, it's a very episodic environment. And climate's really sort of driving the abundance of mammals, but it's not really climate, it's food availability, which is then related to cover. So what we've done is built a series of, of tools and API onto the Earth Engine, which allows anyone to, to go in with their lat long, with their polygon, their bounding box, plug it in, and it will spit out a graph, but it also spit out the, um, you know, the actual raw data itself. And in this case here, the people have built a, um, an autoaggressive moving average model to predict the desert hopping mouse abundance. And you can see there, you know, it fits pretty well as the amount of green cover jumps up, the amount of desert hopping mouse, the desert hopping mouse population is jumping up as well. So it's, it's one way of, you know, sort of, the ecologists don't need to read the paper, they don't need to code the algorithm, they don't need to understand the science, they just need to know that they're getting you know, good quality output from the other end, from the API, and then they can value add to that, they can do their science. <clears throat> Another thing that I, I really like about the Earth Engine <laughs> is that is the way it, it's kind of disrupting this whole land clearing debate in my home state. So we've, we've been mapping land clearing now for 15 years. Um, it's pretty contentious. And over the 15 years, there's been a, you know, a number of policy changes. So this is the land clearing rate, you know, it's jumped up in the 2000s and, and dropped down again. As the government changes policy levers, the amount of clearing will go up or go down. And there's always debate between you know, the people that want production, the government, 
and the uh, conservation groups. You know, they're always trying to balance production versus conservation over time. The really cool thing is that like the actual science behind mapping the land clearing, the actual land clearing figures that we come up with have never been in doubt. All these people have always been sitting on our science advisory committee. Um, probably my favourite meeting of the year. They all come in there and fight violently, but they're always really happy about <laughs> the stats that come out. So that's kind of cool. But what's interesting in this case here is this, this little dip at the end, this little rise up here. So a couple of years ago, we had a change of government. They relaxed the vegetation clearing laws and <clears throat> people allegedly started clearing again. I have to say allegedly because the official figures haven't been released yet, um, but they've been leaked and they kind of look like this. And I'm, I'm in the same building as the official figures, so I can tell you they actually do look like that. So what's happened here is <clears throat> that a conservation group has gone to FigShare. They've pulled down a published land clearing model that's there. They've coded it up in the Earth Engine, in this case, just in the, in the interface. And they've actually proven that a land clearing event, in this case, some stuff up here in the Gulf, it's, it's pretty marginal, but it's a pretty important ecosystem, was cleared um, at a time when it wasn't allowed to be cleared, it, was in, it wasn't permitted at that point. The landholder subsequently applied for a permit to clear, but they cleared, they basically jumped the gun. This seriously embarrassed the government because you know we've got a land clearing division there, but all of a sudden, there was this realisation that, you know, hey, the public could actually see change happening quicker than they could. OK, it's disrupted the thing. And what's, what's happened now is that, you know, a lot of these environmental groups, they've got this awesome fusion table of all the permitted areas that, you know, may be about to be cleared across the state. They've harvested it from state databases. They've stuck in a fusion table. And they're monitoring in real time. And they're getting, they're mapping change quicker than the government can. And that's kind of embarrassed the government into, you know, really changing the processes, updating the data and, and putting it out there a lot quicker. It's made the government much more transparent. It's democratised the entire process. And you know, I think that's a, that's a really good outcome. <clears throat> All right, but as, as cool as that is, one of the things I've been kind of playing with a little bit sort of recently, I guess, is hyper-local uh, querying. So rather than me going to the Earth Engine and, and asking questions of it, I've been trying to work out whether you know, it could actually tell me stuff as I move around the environment. So I've got a couple of models that, <clears throat> that kind of run on my phone, um, depending on what I'm, what I'm doing. So one of them will basically look nearby for water. I like to go and you know, do a bit of bird watching at times. Um, and often, you know, if there's a nice inland water source, you'll find a few birds around there. If you're in the Northern Territory, you'll probably find a few crocs around there, so we don't want to get too close to it. And so it's pretty easy to write a query to detect water. And basically, whenever I'm within 500 metres of some water, it'll go, whoa, there's some water over there. It'll pop up a, you know, the, the lat long. It'll allow me to open the maps or open up some street view. Not there often is street view and inland water sources, but um, <clears throat> you know, to sort of show me the way there. Similarly, I've been running you know, requests looking at NDVI time series. So looking at you know, whether there's an anomalous cover event nearby. And that's really interesting, you know, moving through rangelands just to see areas that have been you know, missed by rain a lot or hit by rain or heavily grazed and those sorts of things. These sort of things, you know, you might run on a map and look and go out there, but if you're driving along and then all of a sudden your, your phone, and I've got it so it announces, it says, oh, very low cover area nearby, and you sort of stop and you, you check stuff out. It's kind of pushing the data back towards where you are and it's, I don't know, it's just an interesting way of delivering it. And because you can actually run these, you know, really small hyper-local requests, you're only querying a small number of pixels at a time, tell me if I'm wrong, um, it's, probably not <laughs> it's probably not doing a whole lot of load on your servers at, at this end, so it's probably not too bad. Um, and so, you know, I kind of think that's kind of a cool way to, do, to deliver data. Another, another thing that I, you know, I like to go for a bit of a mountain bike or a run or do some spotlighting. So when I get to a new spot, I'm, you know, one of the first things I do is try and find a nice patch of forest. Now you can look at that at maps, but hey, it's an earth engine, earth engine request, so, you know, there's no reason why you couldn't, um, you know, in Google now, for example, um, if I can get Google now up, say, OK, Google, show me the location of the closest forest. Finding the nearest forest to your current location. OK, so, <laughs> so that's intercepted new Google now, and now it's basically running a model, looking at the, basically doing a model to detect forest nearby my little area. 
Um, and hopefully... The closest it, forest is a chamise trail loss. I don't know whether that's your closest forest, but um, it's popping up a map now on my phone to tell me how to drive there. Um, and so, <laughs> here we go. I don't know. Where's the forest? New Mexico. Mexico. <laughs> it's all been cleared. Oh, yeah, there's some sort of, what is this? Um, open space preserve, Rancho San Antonio. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. All right, so I do the same thing for water. And so, you know, there's, there's different ways of, of being able to deliver data and get it out there at the other end. And I think, you know, that's one of the really promising ways that, you know, we can start connecting the research to the operationalization and then to deliver it at the other end so that, you know, citizens can take it up. Not all of us want to stare at maps all the time, but if you get data pushed to you, that's awesome. Almost beer o'clock. So when I was thinking about this, I thought, what's the most useless thing I can do with the Earth engine? And I thought, ah, <laughs> I'm going to build a lamp. So I used to use the, um, the uh, Google Geolocation API and the Translate API to sort of announce to my house when I was out riding every five minutes where I was as I was riding along. <laughs> Strangely enough, someone accidentally bumped the speaker with a hammer the um, <laughs> second day after doing it. So I thought, all right, I'm going to build a lamp. So this is my um, earth lamp, my earth engine lamp. And what it kind of does, if this starts up, is that as I travel around, um, is, am I going to start that? Yep. As I tell them, look, I even did a production video of it. As I ride, the lamp basically runs a histogram reducer. Got my, it runs a histogram reducer, works out the surrounding land cover type, and then lights my little light up in my lounge room with whatever's nearby. Um, since I've been to the States, it's been sitting pretty much red most of the time. But you can see, you know, different areas. So when I'm kayaking, it's blue. I'm at the beach. It's a mixture of urban, so it's purple. Um, and it, it's sitting on, there on a Raspberry Pi, sort of, you know, just running there in the background. So it's, it's kind of a silly kind of an outcome, but it's this kind of thing that, you know, takes the research to, the, to you know, the operalization to the delivery to a, to a whole new, you know, possibly silly level. But um, it's kind of nice that, you know, people at home know that I'm, I'm not in the forest, I'm actually in an urban area working. <coughs> so, um, so that's, that, that's kind of it. I, I think the opportunity, I, I really want to thank the Earth Engine team for allowing, you know, for actually building a platform that allows this kind of thing to happen, to actually take research, which we're all doing, through to operalization, and then actually be able to deliver this to people in a format that, that people can actually use. And I, I really thank everyone here for making that happen. The rest is, is up to all of you with the, with the really cool algorithms and stuff. Thanks a lot. Okay, in the, first, in the first instance, I guess, you know, some of the producers came to us. So, you know, we started talking with a few, we made some products that looked pretty cool. Okay, and then producers started coming to us. So actually not producers, but extension groups and regional bodies, they came to us and they got projects up to build, you know, extension front ends, extension frameworks that could take property scale information as well as the remote sensing data and put it out there. So in the end, it was driven by producer bodies that, that, you know, that could see the value in this. And a few, you know, a few really good producers that, um, that could see and they could actually recognise the value that, that a lot of this data gave them in terms of, you know, being able to cite watering points to ensure better utilisation across their paddocks, um, you know, to have the data that they could actually go to a bank with and start a conversation about, you know, hey, I've been managing my land really well. Um, can I have, you know, a loan to put some more fencing in here or something like that? So. Um, just had to have those, you know, the second follower, I suppose.